You're listening to Bible Truth Feed, a podcast by Christadelphianvideo.org for Christadelphians and all those seeking the truth about the Bible message. Join us now as we present our latest episode. Reasons to believe the Bible. It's an interesting subject, isn't it? Because there are many reasons that each of us may have for our belief. But the Bible speaks to us in many different ways as to where belief can come from. We're going to have a little look uh, this evening at our journey of thoughts, I think. not. But we're going to have a look, first of all, at the beginnings. So where does the Bible say that it all began? Where did we come from? Where did the stars and the planets that we see around us come from? And linked to that, we're going to have a think about the hope very early on in our address together this evening, because the Bible has a unique claim that there is a hope for all of mankind without exclusivity. Then we're going to have a look at the consistency of the Bible and the moral authority. Um, We know, don't we, that today there are many different ideas as to what is right and what is wrong. And generally speaking, People believe that what is right should be open to your own perspective, your own personal opinion, and that truth is in the eye of the beholder. What does the Bible say about that, and what morals does it speak about? Then we're going to have a look at a particular favorite subject of mine. We're going to delve into a little bit of archaeology. Uh, There's a huge amount of archaeology that we could cover, but conscious of time, We're going to pick out two examples of archaeological evidence that prove the Bible true. And then we're going to finish off by having a look at Bible prophecy, thinking about what the Bible says is going to happen, has come to pass, and it's history for us. But we're also going to have a look at the future. What does the Bible say is going to happen uh, on this earth, uh, future to our time? And then we're going to draw our thoughts uh, to some conclusions. So then let's open our Bibles to the very first chapter in Genesis uh, and chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 starts off with an incredible unique claim about where everything comes from. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is incredibly elegant and profound and super simplistic. The Bible makes a unique claim that the things that we see around us did not happen by chance. There was a deliberate intent by a creator. The Bible goes on to say an all-powerful creator and that there is no other God beside this God that created the heavens and the earth. The chapter goes on to talk about the particular focus of creation on the earth. And it says he made the stars also in verse 16. It's almost like a side comment. And so that is where the Bible claims everything that we see around us, the stars and the planets, the creation on the earth, very life itself comes from God. So that's the biblical view. What is the alternative view uh, that people put forward? Well, the most popular view is the Big Bang Theory that some of you may come across. And this is a theory that many scientists subscribe to as an overarching umbrella as to where life came from. We're not going to go into a huge amount of detail about the Big Bang Theory, but in a nutshell, What it is, is that everything that we see was condensed into a small mass of subatomic particles. How that happened uh, remains a mystery. But this mass came together, not even classed as mass at that time. It's known as dark matter. And that something happened that led to a mass inflation point. So this highly condensed matter shot forth at incredible speed, faster, much faster than the speed of light, 
the fastest uh, thing that we can measure in our known universe. And it's spread out. And that is where we are today. Some 13.8 billion years later, this is where the solar system, the galaxy, the deep space came from, is one particular point. Now, what's interesting to note about the Big Bang theory is, is that it is a theory. And even though there is a lot of scientists who will subscribe to it, when you start digging a little deeper, there is huge divergence of opinion as to what the Big Bang theory is all about. They no, have no idea how it was that the start came from, what was prior to the Big Bang. How did these subatomic particles, the dark matter, come together in the first place? We don't know. And the reason is that we still don't really understand how gravity works at a subatomic level. And unless we understand gravity, we don't understand the forces that drew this matter together in an incredibly small time and space and led to a massive expansion. We don't know what powered the inflation. There have been ideas across the entire spectrum as to what this dark energy means. When you see the word dark, that pretty much stands for don't know. And so over time, people have thought and conjectured about how all these things came together. But as time goes on, you start to realize that it is a belief system with some believing one thing, some believing something else, and a whole spectrum of belief uh, in between. And no one really knows how matter was created. How is it that this dark matter led to atoms, electrons, protons, and neutrons, and so on, that we understand makes up the fabric uh, of the universe. And as a result, there are many, many unanswered questions. And one of the interesting ones, um, and there are many, is the lack of inherent uniformity. If you have an explosion that goes outwards, you would expect a certain degree of uniformity uh, in the universe, and that's simply not present. There are massive parts of space where there's nothing there at all. And in some parts of space, there are huge galaxies and constellations. And there's something called the Hubble constant, because up until Hubble was launched, it was imagined that even though the universe is expanding, it is decelerating in terms of its expansion. Well, as you know, Hubble went up. Some of us may have even been alive when that happened. And it took them eight years to analyze the data because it told them something that they didn't want to hear. And what it told them is that the universe is not only continuing to expand, it's expanding at an increasing rate. And they've conjectured that it's 70 kilometers per second. Now, that goes against the entire principle of the Big Bang Theory, because however you think and conjecture what dark energy means, it should dissipate. That matter should not be continuing to go forward. And again, so just recently, some 20 years ago, man's understanding of the Big Bang Theory was turned on its head through the Hubble telescope. And that's the problem with science, is that it continually changes as man's understanding um, improves, so it might say. But the sad thing is about the Big Bang Theory, if the universe is continuing to expand, then human life as we know it will cease to exist. All life will cease to exist at some point. Let's ignore the fact that the sun will burn out. But if everything is getting further and further apart, the energy that is required to sustain life will take more energy to get to than it's able to provide. So in essence, the Big Bang Theory offers no hope at all for any of us means that we die, and there's no hope after we die, and that there is no hope for humankind or any form of life in the universe. And it's known as the universe will go dark as energy is consumed and not replaced. That's in direct contrast to the hope that the Bible describes. Because the Bible describes that this wasn't something that God did to fill the time. But this had a specific purpose and plan to it. We read in the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 7, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. So we're introduced to this concept that we are created 
as human beings for God's glory. We might think to ourselves, how do we understand what that word means? And perhaps in its simplest form, if we have children, if we have nieces and nephews, if we have young people that we're working with, and we pass on a bit of our knowledge, hopefully some of it from the Bible, some of our wisdom, and then we see that those young people take that aboard and are kind to each other, are considerate, aren't self-centered and self-absorbed, we feel a degree of gladness and happiness. That is this idea of glory. When something that has free choice decides to do that is right, rather than something that is wrong. And that's what God has created us for, is to follow after his commandments, and in so do we give him glory. And of course, the converse is true. When we teach our children, to try to teach them to be good human beings, and they do the very opposite. There is shame and and sadness. And if we care about those children, then there will be punishment, whatever that punishment form might take. And we know inherently, don't we, that children need guidance. Remember, we had uh, somebody staying at our house once who was a nanny, and uh, she said the children that she was looking after, went to a restaurant with their parents, and children couldn't decide what to eat. So the parents thought it would be a good idea to order everything on the menu so the children could select which food they wanted. You think those children are happy? Absolutely not. They are deeply unhappy because happiness does not come from getting everything we want. And of course, those children... Um, are a product of of parents who really don't understand that there is a guiding principle that we're trying to give to our children, that they make the right decisions in life. And so, too, the Bible tells us that if we follow a set of principles that will lead to ultimate happiness in God's kingdom. The hope of the Bible is that we develop an understanding, a belief, And of faith, we had Hebrews 11 uh, read to us. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So there are things in the Bible that we can prove to be categorically correct. Things have happened. But it's not a science book. It's a book of belief. And each and every one of us, the Bible claims, we must develop our own faith. And Hebrews 11 verse 6, it is impossible to please him unless we have it. And if we have it, we believe that he is, that God exists, that he is responsible for creation, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So if we pass away, we die. That's not the end of the story as far as the Bible is concerned. And so this understanding, which leads to faith, can't remain passive. The Bible goes on to say that after you come to an understanding, we are baptized. He that believeth and is baptized should be saved. Mark 16, 16. And I was talking to someone just a, a week ago about someone who came to knowledge of the Bible, and they were in a profession that they thought this profession is not right in my understanding of the Bible. And his wife pleaded with him to not get baptized just yet. Wait a couple of months until you get your pension and then then be baptized. And he said, no, I've come to knowledge now and I want to be baptized now. An incredible act of faith that led to him to leave that job and to take a significant reduction uh, in his pension. And that's what sometimes belief requires to follow after God's way and not our own. And baptism is a symbolic death and resurrection. We read from this platform and in in, in many other uh, talks about the reason for the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the perfect sacrifice for the sins that we commit. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Romans 6.23 tells us. 
And so when Jesus gave himself as a sacrifice and died and was in the grave for three days, he was raised again to immortality. And so that simple act of going into the water, once we've developed our faith and our belief, and coming back out again symbolizes our spiritual death, the old person, the old way of thinking, the old self-focus and self-obsession is replaced by service of the Lord, putting him and others before ourselves. We are born again. The Bible doesn't talk anywhere about infant sprinkling, but is incredibly detailed upon the importance of adult baptism. And even though it's a very simple symbol, it has a profound impact upon all of those who go, the family and friends, those who are baptized. When they see a baptism, it helps us to remind ourselves of the vows that we took, that we too made that judgment to follow after our Lord. And how are we measuring up? What kind of things do we need to improve in our lives? And for those who are yet to make that decision, it's a very visible testament that this person is now born again. For them, death will have no power over them. There's great joy, the Bible says, in heaven over a sinner that comes to repentance. And so it's even though it's a simple symbol, the scripture makes it very, very clear that it is a public testament of the joy of sins forgiven and the salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately, a place in God's everlasting kingdom on the earth. Isaiah chapter 2, we won't turn there, talks about everybody going to Jerusalem, Mount Zion, to learn of God and his ways. And there will be a great time of peace and righteousness. And so that's the contrast, isn't there, between the Big Bang Theory, where mankind dwells in darkness in the grave and has no hope, and the light of the gospel message, that through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can all have everlasting life. And so that's something that, that really speaks to many people, that there is a wonderful hope that is available to everyone, irrespective of your age, your gender, your location, your ethnicity. It's open to everybody without equivocation. But the second thing we're going to have a look at is the consistency and moral authority uh, of the Bible. We alluded this uh, to this in our beginning, that we've seen today a movement that things that were acceptable years ago are not acceptable today, and things that were acceptable years ago are not acceptable today. So who's right? Those people then or us living in this age? Well, the Bible does not change. And the reason for that is, is that it is said to be God's word. For those of you who know the Bible well, you'll know that it's not just one book, it's 66 books. It's been the Old and the New Testament. That there are many different writers, over 40 of them, talking about thousands of different places and locations and people, and written over 1,600 years. And if you'd like to know more, and I'll plug it here, We've just started our seminars in, in Mumbles, and everybody would be welcome to physically meet in this hall um, or join online to learn about this incredible, unique book. But what is the interesting thing about the Bible? Well, it claims in its entirety to be God's inspired word, that even though there are over 40 writers, there is only one author. And we can't pick or choose which parts of the Bible we like to amplify and which we would like to forget. The Apostle Paul explaining to Timothy, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so we've got to take the Bible message and its entirety. And one of the incredible things when you start to read this book is the number of connections. And this algorithm has calculated that there's almost 64,000 connections between different passages in the Bible. There may be even more than that. It's incredible how the consistency of the message applies throughout. 
that there is a hope for all of us, all the way back from the very beginning, all the way to the end. And as when we're trying to study the Bible, we'll realize that certain phrases, certain people, certain places can be picked up again. And as we learn about how to do Bible study, we can elaborate our knowledge through cross-references. And one incredible thing, nobody can ever feel that they know it all. And each and every one of us, old and young, can always find something new in this incredible book that speaks to the consistency and power of the message. If this had been written by man, it would be full of holes. How could a writer living in a different location, different cultural background, different experiences, write something as consistent with someone in a completely different place and time? Only through the divine inspiration of God as the author. And there are structures that we can look at. A chiastic structure is one so structure that you have repetition. So you start off with a point, you make another point, then you build to your main message, and then it repeats itself going back out like a ripple um, in the water. And this is a very simple one. Whoever exalts himself, so whoever thinks he's fantastic, will be abased, will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And so the very simple structure of the Bible is also teaching messages about turning the ideas of man on their head. And if you're interested in uh, scriptural coincidences, Blunt wrote his book uh, in about 1849, and that's still read by people today that analyzes in some detail the different uh, undesigned, he says, coincidences, things linking together that you wouldn't might have first thought about. And I was thinking of doing a case study in that, but I'll leave that one to you. It's incredible when you start to look at events in the time of Christ and the people and the characters and what they say and how it links to the geographical location uh, where they find themselves. <clears throat> the other thing that the Bible has is an incredible moral authority because the Bible is definitive in how we should live our lives. It also mentions to us the assessment of human nature. And there is a, a battle going on between the humanistic view and the biblical view. The humanistic view believes that man is inherently good, but sometimes bad things happen to people. And so that's what drives them um, to go bad. The Bible makes a different assessment. In Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the writer says, through inspiration, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So the Bible makes a very stark claim that left to our own devices, we can go bad ways. The Apostle Paul said, for I know that in me dwelleth no good thing for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I don't really want to do, that's exactly what I do. Romans at chapter 7. And so the Bible presents us with this conflict. And when we understand it's a conflict, it helps us to try to overcome. That there is a conflict between us, between doing what God wants us to do and what me might want to do ourselves. And it's a battle that we need to overcome. And incredibly, in Leviticus, we have principles established in the Old Testament that follow through into the teaching of Christ in the New Testament. And some Christian religions have de-amplified or detuned the Old Testament to their cost and shame. Leviticus 19, verse 15. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. We think about hierarchical structures today. The poor are often ignored, and those simple people in life are put down in favor of those in power and authority. The Bible says that should not be the case. It goes on to say, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. 
So if you want to follow me, says God, you've got to treat everybody the same. You've got to love your neighbor as yourself. How difficult is that? It turns on itself the humanistic idea of focusing on self and developing your own truth and what works for you is what is right. We have the principle in the New Testament, for the poor you have with you always, and whensoever you will, do them good. It's an interesting fact that the Bible makes it clear that there will always be a disparity of wealth in this present life before God's kingdom comes. There's nothing you can do about it. So therefore, the obligation of those who are blessed with material things or with time to focus on looking after those who need help. It's a completely opposite paradigm to the materialistic world that we see ourselves in. And so, can you see that there is a different focus of attention from the scripture that if we are well blessed, it's not down to us and our own skill, but it is God who has blessed us so that we can act on his behalf and provide whatever is necessary in due season when it's needed. Jesus combines those two commandments um, in Matthew chapter 22, and he talks about loving God. And if you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, then you will love your neighbor as yourself. And very simple message that the Lord Jesus Christ was conveying. This is a love through action, not inactivity. We don't cut ourselves off from everybody, do we? And just study our Bibles. It is a living faith that has to be manifested, has to be shown forth in what we do. <clears throat> and lastly, the idea of bearing burdens. Galatians 6 verse 2 talks about this idea of bearing each other's burdens and fulfilling the law of Christ. And it's a realization that Christ has borne the biggest burden. He has taken away sin out of the world so that we can have life. So let us bear each other's burdens. And there's a lovely idea of the burden bearer, because sometimes someone is going through a terminal disease or illness or other circumstances in life, you can't take their burden away. But the idea of the burden bearer in scripture is to take the weight for a period of time. The burden bearer doesn't want to put it on the floor because the amount of effort to take it back up again is disproportionate to the benefit. And so the burden bearer comes and takes the weight until the burden bearer is able to continue. And that's the emphasis of the scripture. It's moral authority is to love your neighbor as yourself. Do not be a respecter of persons. To focus on the fatherless and the widows, those that can't look after themselves. It turns on its head the modern philosophy. Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. How will he sustain you? Through blessing others around you to act on his behalf. And so we see that the Bible comes with it a strong and powerful moral obligation. We've focused on loving your neighbor as yourself here, but there are other deep and meaningful principles that the Bible claims if we profess to be servants of Christ, we must follow. And it never changes throughout ages. It remains the same. And there's always pressure in society to conform to the values of the day. The Bible says we've got to be strangers and pilgrims from that. We've got to be different because the political system that we want to follow is the one defined in the Holy Scripture, that there will be a kingdom and the king will be Christ. Let's have a look at archaeology. I brought um, some books with me. The Bible in the British Museum is always a very good book. I've got about 
400 copies of these, if you want one, let me know. I've also bought this one, Ashurbana Palace, a recent um, exhibition in the British Museum, sponsored by BP. They feel a bit guilty about their petroleum. They want to show that they're trying to look after the earth. And Ashurbanipal, his, right, his grandfather was Sennacherib, that we're going to come and have a look at uh, in a couple of moments, if this clicker works. Implemental is me. Let's have a look at Israel and Assyria. So we're going to have a think about briefly in the Old Testament, two kingdoms. Uh, one, Israel, this little strip of land here. And then the other one was a superpower of the age called Assyria. Now, there's the Assyrians. You can see Ashurbanipal. Uh, he's pictured killing a lion. Uh, it was thought that only the king in Assyria could kill lions but they made sure that it was pretty badly injured before the king got anywhere near it, just in case the king killed him. So we're going to deal now with a battle that's going to take place um, in the land of Israel, and it's called the Battle of Lachish. We have the Assyrians coming down from the north. They're coming through the land of Israel, and nothing seems to be able to stop them. And if you're fleeing, you're given a choice. You can either go to Jerusalem, where there's God's king called Hezekiah, where there's the true faith, where there's trust in God, or you can flee to a fortress town called Lachish, which had a treaty, a deal, a political connection to Egypt. And the Bible is always about salvation. And so there's a choice that you could make if you're fleeing. If you're in Jerusalem already, you can stay where you are. If you're in Lachish already, you might want to go to Jerusalem. So what, what happens? Well, Sennacherib comes down um, into the land. He bypasses Jerusalem and captures all the coastal towns until he comes to Lachish, which, as we mentioned, is a fortress town. And Lachish is put to siege. And if you go to the British Museum, you can see there on the walls a very detailed uh, overview of what actually happened uh, through carvings in the wall. And ultimately, Lachish falls, and that city uh, is destroyed. And there's very graphic depictions as to what happens to people. These poor people here are being skinned alive. Others are being sacrificed, their throats being cut. Others being put on spikes when they tried to escape the city. So the Assyrians were a brutal, barbaric people. And this is what happened to Lachish. And then this king here is having all the booty of Lachish passed uh, before him. Unfortunately for him, someone smashed his face off um, in a little bit of uh, vengeance and anger, probably um, hundreds of years later. So what happened to Jerusalem? for those who selected where God dwells. Well, Hezekiah was a great engineer. Um, with all these refugees coming to the city, he realized that it wasn't big enough uh, to put everybody in. So he massively expanded uh, the wall. You can see how thick it is. And he built it through people's houses. Incredibly, Isaiah prophesied that this is exactly what would happen. And it says in Isaiah 22, verse 10, you've numbered the houses of Jerusalem and broken down the houses to fortify the wall. And you can go there today. Now, I've jumped on this wall. Uh, you shouldn't do that. But I thought it would be a good idea just to step on the wide wall of Hezekiah. I'm lucky to be here today. But it's an incredible testament that what the Bible said was going to happen, happened. But that's not even the most remarkable thing. He also built what's called Hezekiah's Tunnel or Hezekiah's Conduit, as a water source uh, for the city. One problem of um, Jerusalem is it doesn't have a natural water source within its, within its walls. So Hezekiah built this tunnel. And the incredible thing is that they started at two different ends at once, came together, came together, and then met in the middle. They did that because they didn't have time to do it all through one direction. What baffles many is how they're able to do that without modern engineering techniques, because even if you're following a fault line, you could still be at a very different height 
But yet when you walk through there, you can see the chisel marks in one direction and the other, and then the meeting spot. Fantastic feat of engineering to give the inhabitants water. But even that is not the most miraculous thing about this story. And there's an overview uh, of the conduit. The incredible thing is what happened to the Assyrian forces that were putting Jerusalem to siege. Sennacherib, celebrating this great siege, wrote on his prism, I have Hezekiah trapped like a caged bird. You can see the original of that. Uh, it's also in the British Museum. And he decorated his throne room with the destruction of Lachish. But nowhere does it talk about Jerusalem falling. And what happened? Well, Isaiah 31 verse 5 says, So will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem as birds flying, defend also he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. And for those of us familiar with the Passover and the work of the angel from Exodus, well, the Bible tells us that in the morning, the entire Assyrian host was wiped out. None of them were left alive. It's fortunate for Sennacherib that he wasn't there when it happened. The entire army was destroyed. Now, the annals of Assyria don't talk about this great defeat. But what is interesting is, is that his two sons, the Bible claims, murdered Sennacherib in his own temple while he was worshipping Nishrog, his god. And then they fled. That's what the Bible says. Well, we look at the annals of Assyria. And we read that Azar Hadon, the third born, came to the throne. But it doesn't really explain why in a coherent sense, because it should always be the first born, if not the second. But the Bible explains, because those two older boys killed their father and decided to make a run for it. And so Azar Hadon became the new king. So that is a message from scripture that we can prove with his history and archaeological evidence, tell us that God's arm of salvation will always be to those who put their trust in him. Don't go to Lachish. Don't put your trust in men. Put your trust in God. Now, another one that we'd like to do is Bible prophecy. In the, in an, about, you've got to do Bible prophecy in five minutes. It's going to be very impressive. So. We had our reading today, and as Christadelphians, we, we think it's important to read the Bible every day. And the reading we had today was from Ezekiel chapter 21. Now, Ezekiel chapter 21 is about the destruction of Jerusalem. He prophesied in about 592 uh, BC and was explaining to a very wicked king, King Zedekiah. It calls him, verse 25 of Ezekiel 21, a profane, wicked prince of Israel. And as we mentioned before, God wants people to do and to listen to him and to obey his commandments. But if they don't, then there will be judgment. And sadly, under this king, there was great iniquity. There was great sin and abominable acts being carried out in this city of Jerusalem. And so God said, I'm going to take it away. Now, interestingly, it says in verse 21, the king of Babylon, what they used to do, when they used to make decisions, was to cut a sheep's liver in half. And this sheep liver is in the British Museum. It's a clay version. It's supposed to teach um, priests how to interpret the different blemishes and spots when you dissect a liver. So we know that to be categorically the case. But the scripture here says, I'm going to make the priests say, go to Jerusalem, because there seems to be a choice. Verse 22, and the right hand was the divination for Jerusalem. And so Ezekiel 21 talks about the destruction of Jerusalem by the king of Babylon known as Nebuchadnezzar. But it says something quite interesting in verse 26. Then said the Lord God, remove the diadem, diadem and take off the crown. So this was going to be the last king of Judah the last king of Israel. We know that there was a man called Herod the Great in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he was an Idumean. He was actually descended of Esau. He wasn't a Jew. Partly one of the reasons they didn't like him. 
But he wasn't a true king. There's an Ezekiel. There will not be a king until whose right it is. Verse 27, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it to him. And of course, that's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to, to turn there, but if you want to make a note of it, in Ezekiel chapter 20, um, 30, 14, 34, we read there, verse 13, about the people being gathered from the countries, from all nations where they've been scattered, and they will come back to the land, and there will be a new king who's called a shepherd. And of course, we know, don't we, that Jesus himself calls himself the good shepherd. So when we look at John chapter 10, verse 11, and we read that Jesus says he's the shepherd, we go back in scripture to see whether this has come up before. And Ezekiel 34 talks about the good shepherd giving the sheep, the people, uh, their meat and their food in due season. So what we have in Ezekiel is an overturn, overturn, overturn of the kingdom of Jerusalem. Now, we mentioned Nebuchadnezzar. He was the first one to do it. Um, and just note there, this, this is on the Ishtar gates, their fascination with lions. The Assyrian Empire became part of Babylon. There was a intermarrying, which is one of the reasons why Assyria was never technically conquered by Babylon. They became the same kingdom. And the Bible makes that very, very clear as well. So the captivity of Israel was completed about 586 BC, and the temple uh, was destroyed. We're going to come back and have a little look at the two further overturnings, but let's just look at one incredible Bible prophecy for just two minutes. And it revolves around um, this king, Nebuchadnezzar. This has been one of the most fascinating things, and it's a talk in its own right. And we're just going to talk about it for two minutes. He had a dream. He saw a man with a head of gold, arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet, part iron and part clay. But the thing that really had a profound impact is, is that there was a, there was hands, there was, there was a stone cut out without hands that smote the image and ground it to powder and then filled the whole earth. And so he was desperate to find out what is the meaning of this dream? And he knew if he told his wise men what the dream was, they'd make up anything. He said, if you're wise men and you're able to predict things and you consult with the gods, tell me what the dream is first, and then I'll believe your interpretation. And they said, well, we can't do that. Uh, only a god can do that, not man. And so he was a very reasonable man and said, in that case, I'm going to kill you all. Until Daniel came to tell him the interpretation of the dream. And he made it very clear that this has come from God. And he explained that in the book of Daniel, it explains the different metals and names Babylon, of course, they're the current superpower of the day. But Nebuchadnezzar would have been deeply upset that his kingdom was going to come to an end and the Medo-Persians were going to come. And then followed by the Greeks. And the Greek empire is mentioned in Daniel chapter 7. And so it's incredible that hundreds of years before these kingdoms come, the Bible details how they will fall. It doesn't mention Rome but it describes it in incredible detail through different imagery of the different dreams and visions that are contained within Daniel. That's a subject in its own right, but just to be aware that we're down here. The Roman Empire is finished. The feet of part iron and part clay are the days that we are living in. And that is when this stone cut without hands will replace the kingdoms of men, Daniel goes on to explain to Nebuchadnezzar, with the kingdom of God that will fill the whole earth. Now, what happened to the Jews after Babylon? Well, Cyrus came along, um, king of Medo-Persia, 
he allowed the people to return. It's called the First Treaty of Human Rights. Uh, it's in the UN in New York. And he allowed them to return. He's the only Gentile in the Bible who's referred to as a Messiah. And it's quite interesting when you translate this cylinder, the kind of things he said, and his spiritual journey to come to an understanding of the Bible um, later on in his life. And it seems clear that he was a deep believer in God before he died. Then we have the Greeks. Daniel chapter 11 talks a lot about the Greek empire. We're going to skip over that. But it's incredible the beauty and the complexity of the detail that we can get through Scripture about these different kingdoms and all who came up. And Daniel 11 finishes off with the time of the end. So that's a, a quick overview of the image from Daniel chapter 2. We're going to come back now to the second overturn that we read uh, in Ezekiel. And this happened in shortly after the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Herod, we mentioned Herod before, he massively expanded the temple platform. He overlaid part of the temple with gold. The Romans did not want to destroy this city. They wanted it as a jewel uh, of the empire. But when they revolted, they put it to siege. And Jesus and 35 years before, said to his disciples, see these things, see this beautiful building adorned with costly stones and covered with gold? And they were like, yes, isn't it beautiful? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. That would have been an incredible thing for the disciples to hear because they thought it was God's house. But again, it's because God's judgment was upon them because they had forgotten who their neighbor was. They'd become respecter of persons. They'd become incredibly disobedient to the principles that they were supposed to hold dear. And so judgment was coming. And in AD 70, Vespasian first and then Titus second, and the city fell. And even though Titus expended many troops trying to save the temple, Ultimately, it was consumed with fire. And because the gold melted and rung off, they smashed up all the stones to get the gold. And so the prophecy was fulfilled that not one stone was left upon another. That was prophecy to the disciples. That's history to us. And you can go to Rome and you can see the Arch of Titus today. But again, God was not going to abandon the Jewish people. And there are passages in scripture that make it very clear that they would go back even after the dispersion um, or the diaspora after AD 70 and the Bar Kokhba revolt of 132. And it says, I will bring you out of all nations. Incredibly, Jeremiah was contemporary with Daniel and Ezekiel. And he, too, is making this prophecy. He's not talking about Babylon because they only went to one nation. He's talking about AD 70. And 500 years hence into the future and say that they would come back. And that's one of the most profound things that's happened in some of us lifetimes uh, in this day, that the Jews have recreated their kingdom in Jerusalem. But there's still no king, as Ezekiel mentioned. So there's Theodore uh, Herzl, uh, who founded the Jewish state. And incredibly, we know, don't we, in recent times, that, that, the, earth, that the nation of Israel uh, was established on the 14th of May, 1948. Incredible Bible prophecy that has come to pass. There it is. The British pulled out. The nation was created. But there was something else in Luke chapter 21, and it says there, verse 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And incredibly for Bible students, even though the nation was established, they weren't in control of Jerusalem until the Six-Day War in 1967. And now for Bible students, there's nothing else that needs to happen before Christ can come. 
One writer, John Thomas, there were many others, Isaac Newton, all believed that before Christ can come, there must be the Jews in Israel and in Jerusalem. And they're there. A miracle in its own right. So let's draw our thoughts to a final conclusion. What is the hope uh, of the Bible? Well, the hope of the Bible is, is that each and every one of us can become part of God's great plan and purpose through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We too, through the waters of baptism, can have a part in God's kingdom. Isaiah 11, verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. He's talking about a vision where there will be equality. There will be righteousness. And because of righteousness, there will be peace. There will be no more suffering. Revelation talks about tears no being wiped away from their eyes. And ultimately, there shall be no more death, for the former things are passed away. And so that's the hope that we have in the Bible. It's a consistent message. There's one author. It claims that that author is God. And for many of us, and a strong tenant of our faith is the consistency, the linkage, the linkages, the Bible study that we can do that reinforces the power of the message. For others, the Bible speaks to us of a, of a moral value that inherently we know to be right, that we should love our neighbors ourselves, that we should try to look after each other, to take care of one another. And if we do that, that shows that we love God. The Bible is also an excellent source of archaeological evidence. I was thinking of giving a top 10 overview of the new finds last year, but it's a bit detailed and a bit complicated. But there are new finds all the time that speak to the truth of the Bible. But it's not just a history book. With all of these historical events, there is always God working out of his plan of salvation with his people, that if they turn to him, he will save them and he will never forsake them. <clears throat> and then finally, the Bible has predicted future events that are history to us, but future to those who they were given to. And we can see that they've come to pass. We can see that those prophecies have been fulfilled in our day and age now. And so for many, it's an incredible encouragement of the faith that we have, that we can see those prophecies fulfilled. We know that the future prophecies will also be fulfilled, that God will rule in the kingdoms of men, and that each and every one of us can have that hope through the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, through baptism, through belief and baptism we can all be awarded the gift of everlasting life. So that's a, a quick run through of many different things. There are lots of areas that you can dive into it in more detail. But as we, we all read the Bible together, we pray that our Lord Jesus Christ and his heavenly father will be with us to open up the understanding, the hope that is open to each and every one of us. Let's grab hold of it with both hands. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the episode helpful. Don't forget, most of these episodes are also available as videos on our video channel, cdvideo.org. So head over and take a look. 
If you have any comments or questions or suggestions, please get in touch or leave us a voice message. We love to hear your feedback. You can email us at btf at cdvideo.org. If you enjoyed the episode, then please share it with others. Until next time, may God bless you in your studies and your walk towards God's kingdom. Amen. Thank you.